Hello, I'm James Riley from Innovation Oz. Welcome to the Bridging the Public-Private Divide, uh, part of the Cybersecurity, the Digital Backbone series that Innovation Oz is producing in partnership with CyberArk. I have with me Dr. Stephanie Andal, Head of Strategic Policy at the Cybersecurity uh, Cooperative Research Centre. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, James. Thanks. And uh, Thomas Fickenshire, uh, Regional Director, ANZ, for the Privilege Access Management Specialist, um, CyberArk. Welcome, Thomas. Hi, James. All right, and the, the conversation today, um, we've just had a quick discussion uh, on the way in. Um, we're talking about th how we bridge the gaps between um, public and private sector cyber efforts um, and how best to kind of share experience across both and what's it going to take to, to bridge um, the divide between the two. I'm going to start with a, a big picture question to Stephanie Andal, um, which is really to say, uh, I mean, there really is no great cyber digital divide is there between the public and private sector in terms of cyber activity uh, crosses both realms. Um, uh, you know, cyber actors are very active in both. Um, and I'm wondering if you can describe what structures are already in place, um, you know, that, that attempt to coordinate in some way the way we approach cyber issues. Sure. Um, thanks, James. Pleasure to be here today. Um, I mean, I think that's a really great question is um, and sort of conversation starter around that is, is there a divide between public and private? Because it's my perspective that really there isn't. Um, malicious cyber actors will attack um, threat vectors and surfaces and organizations with, impun without, with impunity and um, without any regard for what type of sector they're coming across. I think Verizon recently released a report, um, it's their digital cyber espionage report, and it said that between 2014 and 2020, um, globally, that the sectors most affected by um, cyber espionage um, included the financial services sector, the professional services sector, and also the public um, public space, this public sector. So we don't see any um, you know, concern on their behalf as to um, one being government and one being in the private sector. And I think what's really critical to note about that is those are some of the new sectors that are now being encompassed within forthcoming legislation that we're seeing here on shore. Um, I'm sure you're probably aware of the new critical infrastructure bill that's um, currently up for submission and consultation. And um, in that, so those are some of the sectors that are now being encompassed within the 11 new sectors um, that are going to be, um, it, and as part of that broadened and enhanced definition of what critical infrastructure constitutes in the country. So I think that's a really positive um, development because we're seeing a recognition that cyber and malicious cyber activity um, happens at scale um, across multiple sectors, across all parts of our economy, and that we really be doing need to be doing more and taking a more um, holistic and proactive approach to mitigating that. And I think on shore, what we're seeing is a consolidation of the ecosystem that we have on that government side to really be mitigating those threats as effectively as possible. Um, we've just, of course, had the newly released cybersecurity strategy in August. And for me, what was heartening to see in that is that we've got a more, I think, established framework as for who's who in the zoo on the government side and what their requisite responsibilities are as it comes to conducting that whole of government cyber uplift. So I think in there, we're seeing a much more pronounced role for the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, the ACSC, which is the organization that's really responsible for ensuring that our nation remains resilient, um, all the way through um, government responsivity um, together with industry and then trickling down to advice to citizens and consumers. So that's um, fantastic. Um, and that is expressed through the Joint Cybersecurity Centers, which are really, really the physical manifestation of the Australian Cybersecurity Center. And um, they've now got a digital footprint and a physical footprint in um, most um, Australian cities across the nation. So that's fantastic. Um, ASD, the Australian Signals Directorate, um, as you well know, also has had um, bolstered um, capabilities and investment thrown at them as well. And that's really positive. 
particularly as it comes to assisting critical infrastructure providers that are going to be encapsulated or captured under forthcoming legislation, and also really as it comes to um, bolstering their offensive cybersecurity capabilities um, offshore, so really targeting that division. So in my perspective, those are the two key areas that I think we're seeing that consolidation across the ecosystem. And then we still, of course, got um, AusCyber, which is the Australian Cybersecurity Growth Centre. They're really responsible for sovereign cybersecurity capability and bringing up those um, products, services, and solutions that we're developing onshore. Um, my organization, which is the Cybersecurity Cooperative Research Center, um, we're sort of the sister cousin to AusCyber, if you will, and sit at that um, pre-commercialization R&D stage, um, working together with industry, government, and academia to be developing real-world commercializable um, cybersecurity solutions and my role within that is looking at the law and policy stream and how we can be really effectively supporting and equipping the nation with um, effective legislative and regulatory policies in the cybersecurity space. And then, of course, we've got Data61 and numerous other players. I could go on and on, but I do think it's really significant that we are seeing more of a settled down approach to what each of our remits is and yeah. how effectively we can be collaborating together in the future. Okay, great. That's a uh, that's an excellent summary of of, uh, of of where we're at, and I'm glad you brought up that um, Verizon cyber es espionage report. Um, I think it was eighty plus percent of cyber espionage was they identified as um, state based uh, actors. So I mean, there's some government involvement right there. Um, but before I get to you, Thomas, um, I wanted to ask. Stephanie, on your PhD research, um, you I think is it a single area or two areas, Chinese cybersecurity policies and digital policy, politics in the Asia-Pacific. Now, I mean, we, we seem to be at a somewhat fraught moment um, in time, I guess exacerbated perhaps somewhat by friction around um, pandemic and trade and these sorts of things. But can you describe, like you've described what's happening internally in Australia, infrastructure-wise, as far as how we deal with um, with cyber, how does the kind of how does that politics work in a, in our region? Can you can you hmm. talk through some of the macro uh, forces there? Sure. Well, I mean that's a monstrous question, but I can try to unpack it the best that I can. Um, I mean, I, I come to this conversation really wearing two hats: the political scientist, and then you know working within the CSCRC. So. I think I'm in a really privileged position to really see what's happening onshore here in our country and then also have that academic perspective that takes that really macro overview of what's happening globally. Um, I think really we're in a very challenging and fast moving moment where um, at that sort of global and supranational level, we're seeing the technological unpicking or decoupling of um, systems and supply chains as we've known it. And we're literally in the thick of trying to grapple with what that means for us from a digital transformation perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective, and then all the way through down to citizens and how we um, will benefit or perhaps not from that. So it's a very, it's a very challenging moment. I think um, lots of different nations are grappling with this, not with not only Australia. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but there's a new technology or a new strategy, sorry, that's come out from um, the White House in October, and it's a critical and emerging technology um, strategy. And what was really fascinating for me is when I looked at this strategy, um, the political scientist in me, in essence, saw this as a containment strategy against rising geostrategic competition from Russia and China um, from the White House. And then the more I looked into it, putting on my um, CSC or C hat, um, I think for us here internally in this country, um, we're kind of like the Switzerland at times in the technology conversation. Um, we don't often want to be prime movers or leading in this space. And we tend to look to our key allies and trading partners as it comes to global best practice for how we want to proceed. So when I looked more closely at this strategy, probably the most significant thing in it is that the United States establishes 20 key technologies that they think are absolutely essential to securing the United States future national economic and military security and preeminence. And um, the usual suspects are in there, including advanced manufacturing, um, AI, quantum, 
Um, and I think for us within this bigger conversation, it's looking at how we can look to our partners like the United States and really leverage from that approach um, as it comes to understanding what those critical technologies are for us and where we really want to ensure some level of digital sovereignty, if I may use that term, incredibly contentious, I know, yeah. um, as it comes to securing our own supply chain. Um, if we're seeking to decouple um, away from those supply chains that have become really, really interconnected and also really essential for our economic security. So I don't know if that's a very good answer to your question. No, no, I think I think it's I, I think it's excellent, and it's uh, it, it leads, um, you know, it, it leads into some very very interesting areas because the the pandemic didn't change everything in terms of uh, the issues of sovereign capability, but it certainly uh, lit a fire under a lot of uh, a lot of things. Um, so I'm going to bring uh, Thomas uh, Fickenshire uh, from CyberArk into the conversation. I guess um, of of what. Uh, Stephanie's just described, um, and in the bolstering of uh, of cyber defences or, or cyber activities from a, a government side, whether it be this uh, critical infrastructure legislation that's just been put up, or the various you know ACSC and Auscyber and Cyber CRC structures that she described, is Australia moving fast enough in this area, particularly given that? Um, you know, the transformation, inverted commas, has accelerated, uh, you know, quite spectacularly this year. <clears throat> it's an interesting question. Actually, I discussed a similar, com uh, com I had a similar conversation earlier this week with someone, a CIO, and we talked about uh, what's really holding organizations back. And I think the answer to, is it fast enough? I, I think in many organizations, it's not. It's still reactive um, and it's complacency to a certain degree. But it's also, um, in many ways, lack of experience um, when it comes to the top management of organizations. And, and they have to, they're all talking about digital transformation. We want to be competitive. We want to basically compete in international markets, drive things forward. But then they run into a lot of problems that they see the first time. And, you know, when you look at board structures and, you know, board discussions, you struggle to find what I would call a digital board. An organization that has a lot of experience how to roll things out, how to structure certain things, um, including um, how you actually bring security considerations into risk management. They did they still look at this from a financial risk perspective or regulatory risk perspective or sovereign, I mean sovereign risk, we just use that term. But digital risk is something that's quite new. And um, cybersecurity, for example, belongs into that space. So I, I believe organizations, some of them who have always um, operated internationally and had that exchange um, to global markets, they're probably a little bit more advanced because they have more depth and experience. Other organizations, the domestic ones that are trying to actually expand, they, they run into problems because they just don't know where to start and, and, and how to structure things in a, in, a, in a proper way and in a sequenced way. So just from that perspective, I would think that um, <clears throat> that I mean, we do we have the sovereign capability right now? And I guess I, I'm talking at a fairly basic level um, to you know build secure digital practices in as we all roll out into this digital economy. But like, how how are we going to bridge that sort of um, skills divide? Going to take that, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. Um, I think we have a lot of capabilities in country. Um, do we have all the capabilities and all the technology components? Um, probably there are gaps. And Stephanie mentioned that we, you know, the US, for example, in Silicon Valley remains a powerhouse. And I think that collaboration with Silicon Valley and the, the brains that exist there it makes sense for us and to bring that in. And I mean, we've got lots of international companies here as well. It is important to actually be a bit more confident about what Australia can do independently. Um, because, I mean, COVID has shown us that, you know, things can be disrupted and you have to stand on your own feet. Um, there is a there is a now a, a group of companies in Australia that are trying to create sort of our, our version of the Silicon Valley here as well. Companies like Atlassian and, and the success of, of these kinds of businesses have shown that we can actually do a lot more than we believe we can. And I think ar around those successes, um, there is probably more people who are, are attracted by that market internationally to come in. And I think there's probably more collaboration happening as well. So it's starting. Uh, do we have all the components? No, but we, I think we've got a lot to, to build on. 
Stephanie, I wonder if I can ask you, um, in relate, like particularly in relation to critical infrastructure. I know that um, I think the draft legislation for that uh, the, the critical infrastructure legislation that was just put through. I mean, there's companies that are not happy at all mm. with uh, with with what's been proposed. Now you can understand what government's trying to do. The end the end goal to make sure that uh, you know obviously the Australian economy is is safe. The Australian people are safe. But um, can you unpick for us what the you know what the what the main issues are for these companies that clearly, uh, you know, the crisis or not, don't want to have their businesses taken over by government even for a short period. Mm. Well, I mean, I think um, the critical infrastructure legislation that we're seeing is really timely. And I know that there's concerns amongst industry about um, the powers that it could afford to government. Um, but I think it's pretty clearly stated in, in, the, in the draft bill at the moment that, um, you know, should government need to intervene, that that is an absolute last resort. Um, and that it's going to be done with appropriate democratic checks and balances built into that. Um, so we are seeing the, the proper oversight safeguards and mechanisms that are being put into the exposure draft at the moment, which I think is really reflective of us as a liberal democracy and really um, adhering to that proud tradition that we have. So I think those concerns are mitigated by a close examination of the exposure draft. But, um, you know, certainly there is going to be a cost to business, um, particularly those sectors that are now being captured by the legislation um, that do not have potential um, cybersecurity maturity that's required immediately to be up to speed. Um, so what would I'm. Be an example? What would hmm, be an example well, of one of those businesses? I think um, a perfect example would be potentially the food and manufacturing or food food sector, food and grocery. Um, I had a conversation with somebody from that sector, um, and essentially I mentioned to them, "Are you going to be putting forth a submission into um, this whole process?" And they said, "Oh, why why would we do that? This doesn't impact us whatsoever." So there wasn't even really any general awareness that one, the legislation was coming, and two, that it was going to be impacting them potentially significantly. So I think more work needs to be done um, really to create greater awareness around this and particularly into those new sectors that previously may not have been across um, cybersecurity and not have the resources, both from a human capital perspective and also from um, you know, internal allocation as it comes to funding dedicated to um, having cybersecurity posture at that critical infrastructure level that's where there might need to be some further assistance in that capacity. Um, and, you know, that's where you might want to consider potential incentivization schemes, um, tax write-offs, um, instant, you know, asset breaks. There's different ways that we could explore this um, that might ease the legislative impost on organizations that are now going to be captured under this legislation. Maybe you can answer this question for me, but the, the global cloud providers would have to be either concerned about this or, or saying that some of the some of the services that they provide or that you know SaaS platform provide, providers um, have on, on their uh, contained within their hyperscale cloud infrastructure that they that they simply can't can't meet the requirements yeah. of that legislation or that it would be a uh, you know a tremendous cost on them and therefore their customers is that a can you explain that somehow well, I don't know if I can explain it but um, it's a really interesting question because I was having a conversation with a large multinational earlier this week and during the conversation what emerged is that they had been talking with their downstream customers um, you know across their supply chain and really noting that they'd been sort of highlighting to them that legislation was coming in this space and essentially they said that the conversations that they've been having were quite rudimentary and again that there was very little vis little visibility across the supply chain that this was going to be impacting them potentially downstream and we noted in the conversation how much scope there is still for still those um, awareness conversations around what is cloud? Um, what is the edge? What, you know, I mean, what is um, virtualization? What are containers? I mean, there's so many different technical terms that are wrapped up within cloud that mm -hmm. I think can be problematic at times. And I think there's so much need for more professionals in this space who can really translate that technical jargon 
into language that people actually resonate with, particularly at the board and executive level. Um, if there's legislation coming in this space for those cloud providers at the board level to have someone on their team who can translate that language into them and say, listen, this is what's happening and we need to be really looking at that. That's for me really the interesting part of that conversation is why do those cloud providers, maybe maybe there's a lack of translation there still between what's forthcoming and what their perception of it is. So I'd, I'd love to get Thomas's perspective on this. Yeah. That's my very tiny granular insight into it. And Thomas, look, we've, we've talked a lot about complexity and growing complexity and, and you know, those sorts of issues, particularly around 5G and edge and cloud and all that stuff. Um, so what's your, what, what's, what's your view? <clears throat> I did mention um, previously that there is complexity, but at the same at the same time, there shouldn't be a reason to hide behind complexity. Again, I come back to what I said before: complacency. Right? Complacency sometimes leads to a, leads to a postponement of important topics um, until to a, until you reach a point where someone someone hits you, or you have a breach in your business, and all of a sudden you wake up. Um, complexity is perceived, but you can actually, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who can translate technical jargon into, into business value. They can actually help you to build a business case. There's opportunity right now. When we talk about cloud in particular or software as a service concepts, there's an opportunity right now to actually take that perceived risk out and start small. You basically have to grab, grab a group of people that you want to actually take the technology forward. Um, you test that with them. Um, you have a smaller footprint. Um, there is all, all sorts of blueprint and methodologies available, so you can get started. So I think, I think yes, that it's complex, but it's possible to overcome complexity by by using a certain methodology and you know work together. Um, I don't think it's a reason to to be complacent. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And I think you've always talked about the opportunity rather than the, the challenge, I guess. But what's the what's the level of conversation like that you have? I mean, are you are you talking? You'd be talking at CEO type level with your customers what about you know at, at board level to to stephanie's point that sometimes board levels don't the board level doesn't always uh have a grip on on you know some of these concepts i i wish we would be at a point where a board would be more engaged or would have representation in form of directors who take that on and actually um actively engage in that conversation i i haven't seen much of that to be honest um, I, I do see people like um, there's a good title, Chief Digital Officer. Um, I have I had a conversation earlier today with someone from a big car manufacturer, and that is a good example of this whole public-private partnership conversation, right? Um, there's a Chief Digital Officer who has the mandate to drive digital transformation in a in a car manufacturing business, and that includes things like driverless cars and driverless or mo mobility services. Now you can do whatever you want within your within your own business, but at the end of the day, you need to work with the public sector. You need to work with toll operators. You need to work with infrastructure providers because you've got to get that car on the road. And there is a lot of interaction between these different participants to make that happen. And when I when I talk to him about what's the biggest roadblock, it's not the technology that sits in the car. It's legislation. It's the lack of interaction. It's it's that kind of stuff that really keeps them holds them back. So it's it's one of those examples. So yeah, I wish I wish the boards would be a little bit more active. I think it's probably starting to to sink in, but we are not really fully engaged yet. Okay, I just uh, I want to stay with you, Thomas, just for a moment on just the introduction of five G. I suppose we don't haven't really seen um, you know the the impact that we we know is coming. Um, but just proliferation of devices, uh, understanding who's talking to who at any given moment on a network or what's talking to what, what are we actually talking about in terms of what we need to do to prepare from a cybersecurity perspective? And for companies that want to try and commercialise 5G tech in areas that we may not even be aware of today, but where do you start as far as you know cyber by design? I guess we'll start with you, Thomas, and then maybe Stephanie, if you can jump in. Well, I'm not I'm not an, an an expert in telecommunications, but in my my view on five G is it's the backbone or the backbone of many many services that are going to come to the forefront. Whether it's you look at telehealth, whether you look at, for example, my example of driverless cars. If if you have a driverless car and it needs to react to certain um, indications, something is in front needs to break. That signal needs to be real time. So you have to have a five G network that actually translates that. If you have any 
gateway, any interface, any connection that's that's built on top of that 5G that is somehow disrupted or there is some sort of late reaction to that signal, then, you know, the consequences could be abysmal. So from that perspective, it's the backbone, but the backbone um, transmits data, transmits signals and services, and there's lots of interfaces. So the, 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 the really important point here is that we understand the architecture that, you know, is based based on 5G networks and we make we have a holistic view on the security, for example, wrapped around that architecture. And that that requires interaction and collaboration between the different participants. If you want to build something in the healthcare sector, it has to be pro, uh, public, it has to be private participants, and they have to look at an architecture or reference architecture for a telehealth service. And it's the same for for um, something like driverless cars on the roads. So that's my view on, on this topic. And, and Stephanie, you're involved with companies that are, you know, working with researchers to commercialise. How, how do we do this in a cyber-safe way? Mm. Well, I mean, I think um, my perspective and the CSCRC's perspective is always taking that secure by design principle. Um, you know, it's really even more than a principle. It's a complete ethos um, to really making sure that we're building all of those things and wrapping them around um, that security principle at the core and really not at ever being an add-on or an adjunct piece that comes after the thought. And that comes all the way through the technology itself, through the processes through the people. Um, it is really, as Thomas, you know, rightly pointed out from that public-private um, partnership perspective as well. It needs to be that shared um, ideal between um, both divides there and really drawing them together. Because, um, I mean, as we all know, cyber is a horizontal and it's going across every single avenue of our economy. And um, if we don't really have that built into it, um, I think we're going to find a much more challenging future. Okay. The, the Area that really interests me always is is commercialising products here in Australia for for sale elsewhere, and I know that's that's what um, the Cyber CSC and Oz Cyber is kind of in, involved, or well, is is very much involved in. So very specifically, where do you? Th oh, there's two things I want to ask. Well, where do you think the very specific opportunities are um, for you know in Australia to produce products for the world, um, but also. From a structural point of view, an industry development point of view, do you think the, the the structures that we have in place to support either researchers or smaller commercial organisations looking to take products global, do you, do you think the structure that we have now is the structure that will help us going forward? Hmm. Yeah, so um, on the first question, I think where Australia really excels is in those niche capability areas. Um, I mean, we've got some fantastic, um, you know, cybersecurity companies and organizations, and the CSCRC is working on some really um, really cutting edge research projects um, that are leading towards that commercializable space. And really, for me, it's I'm not always trying to compete with the global technology players because um, that can be challenging at times. I'm not saying we can't do it. Um, you know, to echo what Thomas was saying, we have so much talent on shore here. Um, that's not to negate or take away from that. But it's also recognizing where there are specific opportunities for a smaller market um, to come in and really significantly um, affect change in that space. So I think from the, the sort of cybersecurity sector, that commercializable space, that's where we're really strong. On the, on the second point, I think we're getting there. I think we're starting to see, as I said, sort of a sifting down of um, responsibilities and organizations and really an understanding that we need to be collaborating together um, and that we are a very small country. Um, we're a very small um, market as well globally. And um, we absolutely um, need to be pulling together in this and really um, leveraging um, everybody's um, capabilities and um, all of that that comes along with it. So from my perspective, it's sort of the mindset change that I'm seeing. And um, just anecdotally, I know when I first started in this sector a couple of years ago after my PhD, there was very much um, a sentiment, I think, um, across um, a lot of the organizations that I dealt with that we need to continually be looking to Israel and looking to what's happening in the Valley, which is all well and good. And I've really noticed, though, a shift in the last probably year or so where um, onshore we're saying, no, um, this is what we have here. This is the talent that we have here. These are the frameworks and systems that we have. This is how we're going to do it for our nation and for our economy. And I think that's a really encouraging sign and also indicative of really strong maturity happening 
um, widely across the economy. So if we can really pick up on that and leverage that, I think that can go a long way to really propelling us towards that digital economy um, that we're really aiming for. Yeah, I think it's uh, – I keep having people telling me of incredible talent we have onshore. I kind of mm. – I, I knew that. I meet amazing people in my in my job. But, um, but also – just a lot of people coming home to Australia, mm. uh, having spent time overseas and incredible talent coming home. So uh, there must be that level of maturity coming, you know, coming back and plugging some of the holes in our own ecosystem. I wonder, can I ask you, look, this is a very pointed question. I don't know whether you'll be able to answer, answer it or not. But for an organisation like Oz Cyber, or perhaps to a lesser extent your own, like, what, what do you think of the notion of having an available but a venture fund available through an organisation like that. Um, it's not unknown in the US, uh, Incutel um, hmm. is a very, you know, laser-focused um, perpetual fund almost now, given their success stories. What do you make of the idea of governments getting involved in that way? We know that CSIRO, quasi-government, has its its main sequence fund. What do you think about targeting um, venture money via a, a government uh, into cyber rather than just grant money that doesn't get the time. For sure. Well, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of Aus Cyber, but I think that any time that we're seeing government interest in uh, pouring investment or even attention into the cybersecurity sector, that is a positive thing in my mind. Um, because I think, you know, historically, um, not only onshore in Australia, but in other countries, we have fought to get cybersecurity a seat at the table. So I think now is a really prime moment um, to really be capitalizing on any interest that we're seeing because I think there's a real deep recognition that cybersecurity is not going to go away and that it can actually be the, um, the fuel behind um, ensuring that our economy is going to be humming into the future. So in my perspective, um, that's a real positive development if that's to be the case, um, but I can't speak to the specifics of it. And I absolutely don't know if that's happening or not. I'm just wondering whether it might, might be an interesting <laughs> idea. Um, uh, Thomas, I guess uh, to you, I'm wondering, um, we've talked a little bit about skills, but just to take the theme, um, bridging that public-private divide a, a step further, I mean, your organisation and many private sector organisations in cyber work very closely or hand-in-glove with government um, uh, to solve to solve their challenges. What, in terms of the um, tra you know training of very highly skilled, very smart people into the cy cyber sector, are there enough people coming through? Or are we still kind of reliant on uh, bringing outside help from from offshore? Um, we're still a little bit reliant sometimes to bring people from overseas into our into our economy. But uh, I had a few conversations with universities recently. And uh, the discussions actually start there because you have people um, who start their careers. And the question is, are they going to start their careers in the private sector? Or are they going to go in the public sector? Typically, they're attracted more by the private sector because of um, perception of maybe better uh, career progression or salary capabilities and things like that. But I think there's a there is a job to be done to maybe think about a career path for people who come from universities and then maybe they go into the private sector for the first one or two years to actually get their hands dirty, but with a few of having a career in the public sector. But I think these kind of um, descriptions and paths and, um, you know, providing what the career in public sector could look like, um, that's where we can do a better job. And I had this conversation with, you know, some of the leading universities like the UTS, um, you know, there's obviously in Canberra, there is the ANU and there's, there's um, all sorts of RMIT in Melbourne. I think there's, there's, there's thinking along those lines. And the other one is actually assignments, right? You actually start a research project at the very early days and you bring um, one of the big agencies into the research project. Or you collaborate between um, one of the big um, government agencies and one of the big private sector um, organizations and define a project, a PPN, like a, a, a public-private partnership project, and bring some people from universities into um, into that sector as well. There are things we can do. Um, again, it, it starts with collaboration. It starts with ideation. Um, we have to do that from our industry perspective, being proactive. If we do that, I think we're going to find a lot of good talent in, in a country and we will be less... Uh, reliant on on you know bringing people from offshore into into Australia. 
Yeah, I guess it is. A, I mean, it is a challenge. I know that uh, Malcolm Turnbull used to talk about this a lot, that trying to make the public sector more porous to, you know, private sector people coming in and out on a, you know, not necessarily a project-by-project project basis, but, you know, you don't have to be wedded to the public sector and you don't have to be wedded to the private sector, I suppose. Um, I guess we're nearing the end of our com- conversation. Um, I wanted to... I just wanted to say thank you to Stephanie and Dal for, for coming on. Um, My pleasure. And thank you, Thomas, Thomas Finkenchev from Cyber. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, James. <laughs>